Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Nick Thompson. You may know me from Netflix Love is Blind, but on this podcast, we sit down with guests from all walks of life to hear their stories, remove stigmas, and understand what makes them tick. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations with Nick Thompson. I am Nick Thompson, of course, and today we're going to have a wonderful episode talking about dating in today's world with a very special guest. Naza Shelley is her name. She is a trailblazer of a woman. We'll get into all of that. But before that, I kind of wanted to take this moment here to talk about dating. Now, it's not something that I have been participating in, let's just say, for over a year now. And to be quite honest, even before going on Love is Blind, I was not very active in the dating scene because it burns you out. And I'm sure a lot of folks that are listening to this who are in the dating realm have felt the burnout or the fatigue that comes from modern dating. There's all sorts of weird social rules. When can you text? When is too much? When is too soon? Should you ever call? When is it okay to ask on a date? A lot of weird social structures and rules that go on. When do you ask for a second date? Which channels of communication are open to you? And I think there's a lot of struggles and a lot of people that are struggling with finding someone and have a genuine connection with them. And from my perspective, where I feel like I was missing was the ability to take the time to explore a connection that may be there or may take a little longer to develop. And I reckon a lot of folks feel that way too, but there's just this stream of endless opportunity, which has been my biggest critique of the dating world is that you're a swipe, a like, whatever, away from another opportunity. Almost releases dopamine of excitement and an adrenaline rush to say who's gonna be next. Maybe it's gonna be someone more attractive. Maybe it's gonna be someone I'm more connected with. And with these experiences that we're all going through, I think that a lot of folks are not taking the proper approach. I think there's a lot of good things that have come from dating, and Nasa and I are gonna talk about that, but the technology portion of it has also created a lot of uncertainty, wreaked a lot of havoc on traditional norms of how people have met, gotten to know each other, and formed partnerships. And building these connections and these partnerships, it takes time. It takes going out on dates. It takes time spending quality time together, doing other things, being normal, maybe cooking, maybe taking a cooking class, maybe going out for drinks or going out for a walk. There's so many traditional norms that almost have just been eliminated, it feels like. And one of the biggest reasons that I went on Love is Blind and decided to participate in that social experiment was because I felt like it addressed some of these concerns that I had where there is a lot of communication issues. There's many channels to communicate on. There's ghosting and breadcrumbing and all of these different terminologies of how we treat one another. But when you go on a social experiment like Love is Blind or any type of experiment where you're eliminating distractions, you're eliminating the multiple channels of communication, and you're really pretty much 100% focused on talking to people on the other side of the wall in this case. And so we all know how that worked out. But when I think about going back to dating or how it must even be worse now that it's been a few years, I had moments where I would do the multiple dates I had moments where I myself wasn't giving people a fair chance and came to this realization um, through many years of dating and a lot of therapy too. But what you need to do to be successful is figure out what you want in a relationship and figure out how you can identify those qualities in a partner when you meet them. And also boundaries, being true to yourself making sure you don't get lost in any type of situation where you lose track of what makes you feel good. Because if you don't feel good, you're certainly not going to make anyone else feel good. Lastly, figuring out what you want is the key to identifying what's going to work and what's not going to work. And 
for me, I know what those things are. It's spending quality time, which is the way that I receive love. It's stability, knowing that that partner is going to be there and knowing that they're always going to have my back. And then the other one is trust, because I personally don't believe you have a relationship without trust. I don't think you have a friendship without trust. I don't think you have any kind of partnership, certainly without trust. So those are the big things for me. And I think if we take the time to understand those, a lot of these dating experiences that we have in the dating world today may go a little bit of a different way. And I think the approach that we need to do with technology and multiple forms of communication is of course, utilize it. Of course, find your best self and put it forward on a dating app or any kind of dating experience. But ultimately what we need to do is just be real and true to ourselves and treat one another like human beings. Use technology as a tool, but not a means. If you like someone, you should tell them you like them. And if you don't, it's okay to say that too. A simple text message that's after a date or two and it's not working out and say, hey, I think you're great. I don't feel a connection. Thank you and I wish you the best in your future endeavors. It sounds like you're firing someone, but ultimately it's a fair way to say, I'm not interested without ghosting someone and still treating people with the humanity and dignity that they deserve. That being said, if we use technology as a tool, not a means, We can use it for a little bit of communication, find out if it's someone that you would like to ask out or if it's someone you would be want to be asked out by and be straightforward about it. And I know that there's gender norms about who should ask for the first date. And then there's some society issues with that as well. But ultimately, my advice is if you like someone, you should tell them if you want a second date, you should tell them If you want a first date, you should tell them if something's not working for you. You should tell them. And if we get down to the point where we use technology as a tool, but not the means, we can open up communication with one another again and take the time to first get to know yourself, what you need in a relationship. Secondly, what you need out of a partner, what they need so that you can find out if you can deliver that and then be human with one another. Treat each other like humans. If it's working, let them know. If it's not, let them know. And I think that's something we can all learn from, which Brings me to our guest today. We're going to talk about dating and what it's been like for Neza to date as a professional, successful black woman. And what she's done is created a dating app called Carpe DM. And this is the member only dating community that's centered for singles with, that are seeking meaningful relationships with successful black women. And with this exclusive interview, we're going to dive into dating today. I'm going to ask her what it's been like for her, what she's learned, her dating experience over the years, how it's changed, how she created Carpe Diem, what her vision for that platform is, and how she believes that by merging technology and merging personal connections, you can actually build a better system or a better experience for what it's like to meet and date different types of people. So... I'm excited to have this conversation today. I hope that you learned something good about dating. And it's a little niche conversation considering it's a members only app, but maybe we'll find some people out there that have found a new way to go meet people with Carpe DM. But we're gonna get into what it's like in the dating world, things she's learned, best practices and advice that she has for all of you. And then maybe we can make dating a little more personal and a little bit more successful and ultimately build beautiful connections with one another. So let's get to it. Today, we have a great guest, Neza Shelley. She's a trailblazer of a person. She's a multifaceted attorney, very inspired to connect people in meaningful ways. She's the founder of Carpe Diem, a dating community created for singles seeking meaningful relationships with professional black women. So welcome, Neza. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm very happy to have you. I'm very, uh, very curious to learn about your journey today and dive into that. I'm excited to share. So let's go. Great. Right. All right. So I'd like to start with a small talk question of the day because we're going to get a little deep later. But um, mm-hmm. what is your favorite thing about D.C., where you live? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I've traveled all over the world. And what I love about D.C. is that 
it's like the perfect size city where you have access to like all the things that you'd want in like a major city but it's also you feel like you can conquer dc like i've lived in like mm. you know china and like even like going to visit new york like it's so huge that you feel like you really can't conquer the city and like know all the nooks and crannies but i feel like dc like you can really feel like you own the city and like you, it's like it's home right so that's one of the things i love about dc that's a really good answer, actually. I'm, I'm, I've never really thought of it that way. I agree with you on New York, though. New York to me is just over. I mean, it overwhelms me. I, I'm yeah. from Chicago. I love Chicago, but I also know Chicago, mm -hmm. so I can see how that might be. Over Chicago's a great city that I hadn't visited for until like maybe three or four years ago, and I went and I was like, "This is amazing!" <laughs> like it was in the it was in the spring and summer, so it was at the right time of the year. But it's a great city. When you described it as a great city, I knew you did not come the nine months of the year that it's brutal to be here. <laughs> I, I would never do that to myself. Yeah. So keep you guys in the best light possible. Yeah. Yeah. I would stick to stick to somewhere between June and August for the best possible experience. Mm -hmm. It's a toss up any other time. Yeah. But yeah. I, I love um, I love D.C. too. I've been there a few times. It's uh, it's very it is very kind of small in a sense. It almost feels like it's like a neighborhood, though, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of cool. Yeah, that's so. what I love about the city. I mean, you know, all the different neighborhoods, all the restaurants, anything that's new that's coming up. But then, you know, we have the Michelin star spaces and, you know, great jobs and great people. So, yeah, it's a good city. Yeah. And when you come to Chicago next, I'll have to give you some good recommendations for food. Please, I'm a big foodie, so I do not feel oh, like I have even scratched the surface of Chicago food scene, so please do. I've been here seven years and I've barely scratched the surface, so it's totally relatable. Actually, why don't we start? We're gonna do some lightning round questions just to get to know okay. you a little bit better. Why don't we start with what's your favorite food? Ooh, you're like coming with tough questions. <laughs> um, I'm, I love food so much, it's hard to say my favorite. It'd be anything like rice and sauce based. Like, so mm. I love like curry. I love, um, you know, like, so I love Indian. I love Thai. I love Chinese, Jamaican, anything that has like rice and sauce. Like I'm going to be good. You know, what's funny is I literally within a 10 minute walk here have a great recommendation for each of those Jamaican. Yeah. I've got a great recommendation for Thai. I got a great recommendation for Chinese. I love, I love, to, that's what I love to hear. So yeah, I'm gonna need that list. <laughs> Would you rather climb a mountain or jump from a plane? That's hard. I mean, I've climbed mountains, not nothing huge. So like, I, okay. I like to get out into the outdoors every blue moon. Um, but I'd actually think I'd prefer, I've never skydived, but I think I would prefer to do that. Like I really oh, want okay. to to do it so i think that's cool what's holding you back probably logistics like yeah. probably just someone being like hey we're going skydiving on saturday like if it's left up to me to plan i'm gonna always put it off but if somebody was like we're doing this i'd be like oh my god okay and i'd i mean i don't think i would jump i think someone would have to literally like push just me <laughs> but <laughs> yeah but like once i'm out there i feel like it'd be okay right i don't know or it wouldn't, and then that's that. Or it wouldn't, it. and then it'd be over <laughs> relatively quickly. So, I mean, yeah. That's That argument, I'm too scared to skydive. That argument's been used to me. It's like either it's the most exhilarating experience of your life or it's the end of your life. So just do One it. One or the other, yeah. yeah. If you were really hungry, would you eat a bug? What kind of bug is it? Like, I mean, is this just like lightning or am I able to like ask clarifying questions? We can, however it goes, you can. So, I mean, I, I think it really depends one, how hungry, cause you said hungry, not like starving, not on like the brink of death or like, yeah. you know, passing out. So I would probably say no, I I mean, no, I don't think so. I think I'd say no too, or at least I haven't yeah. experienced that. Well, who knows? Cause when life gets real, probably, I don't know, but I'd have to think I'd have to be like, on the brink of death starving like and there's nothing yeah. there's no alternatives yeah and it's just yeah, yeah i guess it's hard to say you wouldn't yeah That's but i mean i think that we've eaten lots of bugs unknowingly so you're fine you're probably gonna be fine and so if that's the way to feel yeah i guess or just like to get rid of that hungry feeling it's probably cool 
Do you know what? It's ironic. So I, I have like a huge list of these questions and I just like pick the ones I think would be fun by guess. Mm -hmm. I actually had a bug that I saw Thursday night and it was like one of those centipede things mm -hmm. and I couldn't I couldn't get to it fast enough and I'm like, I haven't seen it since and I'm afraid I ate it. it yeah, it's it, it definitely. Mind. There's statistics on like how many spiders you've eaten in your life, like how many bug parts per million can be in like chocolate and I've like, no, I've eaten my weight in chocolate. Oh. So I know that I've probably eaten like <laughs> tons of bugs. So, oh you know, gosh. just yeah. sort of like cognitive it. dissonance, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, how long can you hold your breath for? Or do you think you can hold your breath for? Um, maybe, I don't know. Like, I feel like whatever I'm gonna say is like super low and people will be like, this heifer has no lung capacity. <laughs> maybe, maybe like 40 seconds, is that a long time? I don't know, I feel like I was a swimmer a long time ago. So like, I know how to like do breath control, but maybe 35, 40 seconds? Is that a long time or a short time? I don't know. I feel like that's a long time. I'm trying to think if I could even do 30. I feel like you can do 30. Like, you want to do this? Should we do it? We should do it. All right. It's just 30 right, seconds. Let's do it. Right. Your mark. Oh, geez. Get set. Go. <laughs> okay. That was fun. That was fun. 38 for me. You're still going. <gasps> After I heard 30 something, I was like, I can let it go. That was, hit about that was bad, like 40 seconds, seconds, right? No, not bad. You called that. Okay, yeah. And staring at the clock did not help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I think it helped oh. that I was just like, yeah, humming a little ditty in my head. I don't know. That's yeah. smart. That's smart. Yeah. All right, let's let's um, let's do let's do a couple more of these and then we'll, we'll get in, into it. This okay. one I'm super, super curious about. How long, well, first of all, if you believed in Santa Claus, how long until you found out that, spoiler alert, he wasn't real? Honestly, I don't think I did believe in Santa Claus. I think my mom, like a single parent of three, I think she let us know, like, these gifts are from me. Like, this is from, like, I bought these gifts for y'all. Like, ain't no, ain't no white man come down this chimney and, like, put these gifts <laughs> under a tree. So I think I probably believed in the tooth fairy longer than Santa Claus. So, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah. You know, it was, for me, it was realizing the tooth fairy wasn't real that led me into, like, investigating Santa Claus. Yeah. And then, every, and, then you're questioning everything, right? Then yeah. it's like, are you my real parents? Like, everything just starts yeah. to snowball. Yeah. And I feel like your your mom did it right. She did. She's just like, <laughs> um, yeah. She she pro she bought all that stuff and she she wanted her recognition for for all of it. <laughs> what do you drink in the morning first thing? Water. Oh, good for you. Very yeah. good. All I right, like and it's the only time during the day I drink water, but I'm just kidding. But yeah. <laughs> what's your go-to drink then? Mine's coffee. Um, <clears throat> oh, I like chai, like so, like a soy chai. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but. I probably could do with that. I mean, do without that too, but yeah. water or yeah, I guess water or alcohol is that. Uh, well, yeah, if, if that counts, I might have to bump up like wine, yeah. tequila, yeah. number one. But otherwise for me, it's water and coffee. Water, coffee, wine, tequila. I'm good. Yeah, I've never, I don't like coffee or beer. So I feel like I, oh, okay. I'm i not invited to a lot of events for these two reasons. So I don't know. <laughs> That's um, true. A lot of beer oh. gardens that I'm just drinking water at and yeah. <laughs> it's cool. I mean, I, I love it. I, I'm not a bit, I'm gluten free. So I don't really drink a lot of beer myself, but you do find yourself in these events where you're like, <sighs> oh, there's nothing for me here. All right. I just left. went gluten free three weeks ago. I'm struggling. Oh, you did. You did. Like, yes. Yeah. Gluten free what, what? and dairy free. And oh, I'm struggling. So when I first yeah. did it, this was like 10 years ago, I did both. And then I only lasted. I went back and, and started after 30 days eating both. And I felt horrible. So I realized how much better yeah. I felt off of it. But the dairy yeah. thing, like, I gave it up for. It's Probably the dairy. Like a year and a half. It's the it's... dairy. Every menu that I see, I'm like, okay, the, the, all these gluten free options, and then like maybe one or two don't have dairy in them, and I'm like, so I can eat like one or two things, period. But I can already tell, like, if I eat something with gluten in it, I can tell, like my, yeah. like I get the gluten rash. Like, did you ever get that? Like the your skin actually breaks out. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I actually would break out like up here. And get yeah, like I'm getting it like on my TMI, like I'm getting it like on my neck, like I'm getting like a oh, okay. rash when I have gluten. So it's like a, yeah, 
I, I'm even more excited about like your Chicago recommendations now because they'll also have gluten free options. They're all gluten free. Like I, yes. there's, a, there's a pizza place here and obviously you're not eating dairy. Um, yeah. They might have like Daya cheese now, I'm not sure, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> they do everything gluten free, um, like homemade. So it's not <clears throat> that cardboard crust that you can get a capstone, <clears throat> you can do pasta, you can do anything. It's so good. I'm so, so we'll, excited now. Yeah, we'll exchange those. What was the catalyst to going gluten free? You know, I just realized there was a lot of health issues. And so you know how you're like on whatever WebMD and you're like figuring out if it's cancer or something else. I'm just like putting in all these symptoms and they're like, yeah, it's probably PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome in women. Gosh. And so, yeah, they're like one of the things that can really help combat that is going gluten free and dairy free. So I was just like, you know what? Let me just try this for a while. So this is only my third week and I feel like I'm doing pretty good, so. Good for you. You know what the key really for me was, mm. was not like putting myself at the beginning in social situations where that was all there was. Yeah. So that Because otherwise that's when I would break. I'd go, oh, I gotta yeah. have one of these donuts. So it's like. <laughs> I did, so I did meal delivery for okay. the first two weeks and that really helped because it was just like, I didn't have to think about it. Like I did gluten free, dairy free meal delivery. So everything I had access to, I knew that I could eat, but it's super hard. Like when you start going out, um, and I'm going to New Orleans for the first time oh. this week. And so I'm just like, oh, I'm not gonna make it. I don't know. Are you? Oh, we're back. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I have to do the beignets, like, right? Like I can't go to New Orleans and not have a beignet. So um, they actually, so I was considering going to New Orleans um, a couple months ago and there are places that have gluten-free beignets. Just, okay, so I could, I'll, do, I'll send them, like, I'll see if I can find okay, them and send them to you. Me too. I'm like, the onus is really on me not to just be resolved that like, I'm gonna have to eat gluten. Like I should, I should do some research. So I, I will, I'll, I'll do some research. <laughs> Very cool. All right, I had one last question here I wanted to ask you. Okay. Um, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but what do you think is the best way to meet someone these days to date? I'm gonna have to go with online dating. So, uh, you know, I'm in the online dating industry, but I mean, the best way is probably by doing things that you love and just trying to interact with other people that are doing similar things. Cause then you know that you have those commonalities. Like one of the most convenient ways is definitely like online dating, right? Like yeah. if it's it's hard to get out, we're in the middle, we're still in the middle, middle of a pandemic. So I would definitely say it's harder for people who aren't engaged in any type of online dating mm -hmm. to meet people. But if you're still active and doing things that you love, whatever it is, then you're bound to run into somebody that loves those same things that you may be compatible with. I love that answer. So with that, I think that's a good segue. Why don't you tell us about you in your own words? Well, like you said, I'm Nasa Shelley. I'm the founder of Carpe Diem. We are an exclusive online dating community. Um, but more than that, we are a tech-enabled matchmaking service and patented video-based dating app that's designed to help Black women, which is one of the most underserved segments of the dating market, find love. And so we're really available to anyone who's interested in dating the most amazing professional Black women um, and finding love with us. And I think that's a, a beautiful way to put it. What what inspired you to go into this route? It's kind of crowded. Um, obviously, you're very focused on yours. But what was your inspiration to sort of get started with this uh, Carpe Diem experience? Yeah, this is a great question. So just really out of personal frustration with online dating. So, you know, I was dating in DC, single, as you said in the intro, I'm an attorney by trade and I was using all the apps. And so I was going out on lots of dates. So it wasn't necessarily that like I wasn't finding people to go out on dates with. It just was that the dates weren't panning out to be like compatible. And so I thought there has to be a better way to online date than like all the time wasted swiping, going out on dates that with incompatible people. And so I looked for an alternative and I couldn't find one. And then I also experienced like one in four black women, like hypersexualized messages, like racist messages, like things are just like awful on online dating. And so I really couldn't find anything that was really made to cater to us, even though I could find like a dating app for farmers. I could find a dating app for, you know, Jewish people. I could find a dating app. And like, that's all great. Like niche dating is perfect, but there really wasn't anything for us. And so I kind of thought I could be resolved that there's nothing for us and just let it go. Or I could create something um, for us. And that's kind of 
how Carpe Diem started. And you have been um, an attorney, which you mentioned. Can you talk mm-hmm. through that? Because that's like such a big jump. Do you still uh, do you still take cases? What type of attorney were you first? And <laughs> tell us about that journey. Yeah, you don't see the connection between online dating and, and the law. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it either. No, um, I, you know, I was an attorney. I did utility regulation. So I was in the space of um, like utility, energy, environment, administrative law. And so I did that for um, almost eight years. And so I worked nice. for the district, the D.C. government. And so I handled cases related to like energy policy, um, setting utility rates. So if you have electricity, which you do and all that stuff in your home, then like we regulate the utilities that provide those services to make sure that they're reliable and consistent and affordable. And so that's what I did for many years. And um, I honestly like got into the online dating sphere and like entrepreneurship through happenstance only because like I said, I saw a hole in the market and I thought no one's gonna make this or no one is making this. So like, can I make it? And along the way, learned a lot of stuff about like entrepreneurship and business and what it means to like be a tech founder and all this stuff that I had no idea about. And I, that wasn't really the impetus for me getting into the business or getting, you know, starting Carpe Diem in the first place. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't take cases anymore. (laughs) I do minimal legal work for my actual company, but now we also have attorneys as well because I know just enough to mess something up, um, as they would say, when you're practicing law outside of your specific area of expertise. Um, So it was great because I was able to get the company off the ground, get it formed, file our trademarks, file our patents. Um, But now we're at the stage where we actually (laughs) use uh, attorneys that know specifically what they're doing. And I would imagine in any kind of app, but particularly a dating one, I've never thought about it until really just now, but there's probably all sorts of regulations having to do with safety too, right? Like location data, all that stuff. You'd be surprised at how few regulations there actually are. Um, So there's stuff around like privacy, like data privacy, like what you actually share and don't share. But the dating industry in in and of itself is pretty like hands off when it comes to taking responsibility for their member safety. They're like, we provide the platform, everything is kind of else is left to you. And that was one of the reasons why we thought it was super important at Carpe Diem to introduce um, 100% verified matches, which means that like we background check every member of our community. And so we check for, you know, whether or not the person is on a sex offender registry, if they have a history of domestic violence or violence, do they have a history of like fraud and like scams? We all heard of Tinder Swindler. Um, So it was really important for us to, of course, like it's still, the onus is still on you the dater to like do your due diligence but we're like dating apps and they could do something right like the least they could do is run a background check and so um that's something that we have integrated fully into our um our onboarding process for our new members so not as many regulations as you would expect but you know we're seeing a trend of more dating apps like uh prioritizing the safety of their members through new features so that's i think that that's great I actually think the verification process is is a is a great start, right? Because I think the only it's been a while now since I've been on dating apps, but the only thing that I ever remember being verified was like my photos that they were me. Yeah. Which I don't know how they're yeah. verifying that, but I guess they have some recon- facial recognition <laughs> somewhere. So that's good to, yeah. to do that. And <clears throat> with with this community that you're building, are there opportunities for anyone to join or is it are you really sticking to like men that are interested in in dating uh, professional black women so we pride on pride ourselves on being sexuality and um ethnicity agnostic so if you are in the lgbtq plus community or if you are a non-black person you are more than welcome to join carpe diem as long as you're interested in dating black women right so that's that's the only caveat like we really wanted to create a space where like black women could be appreciated uplifted um elevated and find meaningful relationships so there's really no qualifier on who's able to join as long as you understand that will be matching you with uh, amazing, successful, beautiful black women. And I, I love that. I love the openness. I saw somewhere online that I was reading about you and you said you're really looking forward to your first uh, Carpe Diem wedding. 
-hmm. So how how close are we? How far away do you think we are from that first wedding? And how many couples have we match made together? That's such a great question. It's funny. It's, we're, we're much closer than we were a year ago, right? <laughs> but we um, just launched Carpe Diem in January. So we launched Carpe Diem in January and we opened it up only for member applications. Mm -hmm. So right now we are um, accepting new member applications and we're vetting our first 500 members. So we opened the applications. We were actually really surprised and, and pleasantly overwhelmed by how many people have applied. Oh. So in less than like three months, we got over a thousand applications. And so now we're in the process of vetting everyone, doing their interviews, and then um, it's pretty soon they'll all be going through their background checks and being onboarded into the app. But we're lucky that, you know, my team, my co-founder, Sally and I, like we have a history of um, creating dating apps and, and creating experiences for singles. So we have in the past match made people who are now married with kids. You know, we had a virtual viral dating show called Lovecast during COVID where we matched people for virtual video dates and then we all got to watch them together online. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and That's that was awesome. fun because a lot of those couples have stayed in contact. Some of them flew across the country to meet each other. Um, so we're excited because we are passionate about matchmaking and we employ other matchmakers that are emotional intelligence and relationship coaches therapists and then really have a, a strong background in pairing people based on true compatibility. Um, so we're really excited for that day where we have our first marriage, which we'll probably sponsor. So I'm kind of like, y'all need to hurry up and, you know, get matched in and, and get a deal. Going. Yeah, seal the deal. <laughs> You could you should add that as like an incentive, right? Hey, yeah, first couple, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna help you with your wedding. Yeah. Uh, when you talk to people about matchmaking, mm -hmm. a lot of the feedback that you get is, oh, you know, it costs a lot of money. It costs this. It doesn't really work. Or you talk to people, and it's kind of almost the same as dating. And so, what about matchmaking to you? Since you have so much extensive experience, and now you have Carpe Diem. What about matchmaking? What are those things in your mind that determine if a couple is truly compatible? Oh, that question took a turn. I didn't think that's where it was going, but I like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me something slightly different, but um, you can you answer know, what you thought I was going to ask too, if you. Okay, want. I'll, I'll tag that on to the end. So, <clears throat> when it comes to compatibility, there's a lot of things, right? But there are some key factors that we kind of looked for, which is like stage of life, like mm -hmm. where you are in your life. And then like the things that you're actually looking for in like your next phases of life, right? So are you looking for kids, but the other person is not looking for kids? Like, are you guys are in the age range where you actually can move towards a meaningful relationship? Are you guys actually in this in the position where you're actually suitable to date? Like we interview and meet all of our members face to face. And so we we get to ask questions like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, like how, how ready are you to find a committed relationship? And we get to hear those responses. So we get to screen for like emotional intelligence. We get to screen for factors that are like the most important, like how important is being physical and like physical intimacy to you? You know, how many times, how frequent do you expect communication to be between you and your partner? Yeah. How, what was like your childhood like growing up? What was your household like, right? These things that psychology actually tells you lends towards helping people make compatible matches that you're not going to get asked on any other dating platform, right? They're not asking because they're actually not super motivated to help you find love. But for us, like that's our only motivation. So we worked with a black female psychologist to create one, our onboarding questionnaire, which helps feed our algorithm, as well as with professional matchmakers over time to understand what types of qualities we need to be looking for to determine if somebody's a suitable match. And it's not just age, sex, location, right? Like that's ridiculous. You mean when, <laughs> when Hinge or Bumble asks you if you're interested in men or women and then just gives you a profile, you go a little bit further than that? Just a little bit, just, just a, little a little bit, bit. deeper, just a little <laughs> bit deeper. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, matchmaking, you know, it's funny because people will ask like, oh, well, you know, we know that traditional matchmaking, one is super labor intensive and it can cost anywhere from 15,000 up to a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And so for us, that's why we say that we're a tech enabled matchmaking service, because just like you have someone that you may need to come and help clean your house, just like you have, you may have an executive assistant or like a personal assistant, people need help in important 
aspects and areas of their lives that they don't actually have the skill set to do things themselves, but they're taking it on because that's what technology is providing for them. So dating apps give you a ton of access to a ton of people, but no real way to filter them to determine who you should actually be interacting with and going on a date with, right? So if you think about a swipe based dating app, I don't have to name them, you, you guys know them all, right? Like most of those people, if you, if you get 50 profiles served to you, maybe three should have actually been served to you based on where you are in your life, what it is that you're actually looking for, what that person is actually looking for, right? So you, yeah. you've you wasted your time going through all these profiles, but only three should have even been considered. So that's why we don't employ swiping at all. Like we wow. only serve you high quality matches. And our motto or like one of the things that we tell our members is, we only inter interrupt your life when it's time to meet someone amazing, right? So we really have yeah. to like, we have to like break the cycle of thinking that constant swiping is at all equated to efficacy or like a result, an outcome that you actually want. We don't believe that there's a correlation there. So if you may get a message from us, you may get a match from us one match a week. You may get a match from us, you know, once every two weeks, you may get a match twice in one week, right? But we're not like wasting your time and putting the onus on you to determine your compatibility with someone. I totally agree. My number one critique of dating in general, and again, I haven't been dating for a while now, but mm -hmm. of dating in general is that there is this idea of endless opportunities because it's just a swipe. And then there's this idea that if one thing doesn't add up or there's one mm -hmm. spark missing on that first date, on to the next, I've got three more lined up this weekend. You know what's even worse is people have great dates. But by the time you get home, you have three more messages from three new people, right? So then it makes you think, oh, well, that was a good date, but maybe there's something better just around, I say just right. around the river bend, like Pocahontas, like <laughs> just around the river bend, there's someone better. And it's like, probably not. Like you probably should focus, you know? Well, that, like, yeah. Yeah. You. yeah. If you, when I, when I would use these apps, if I went on a good date or I was even talking to someone that I liked, mm -hmm. very rare, I might be talking to two people but very rarely would I set up two dates without going on one. Because if you go on one and you like them, why not give that your attention? Yes, yes. And uh, in my experience, too, a lot of times those sparks that you do have, they fade because you don't take the time to get to know mm -hmm. someone. So I think yep. that that is a, a great, really modern approach, um, kind of like almost postmodern in a sense, because you guys are doing all the heavy lifting while still mm -hmm. giving that that digital interface that we're accustomed to communicating over now. When you <laughs> launched, what was your expectations from a member perspective? Did you have any ideas? And what does that look like today? How many <clears throat> wonderful, beautiful, single black women do you have? How many wonderful, beautiful, suitable fellas and partners do you have? Yeah. It's so funny, like, you know how like you're making something, you're like in the lab and you're cooking it up and then, you know, you, you present it and then you're like, is anybody gonna like it? Like, is anyone going to use this? Like, is anyone going to, like, do I think that people need this? But like, in reality, like no one needs it, you know? And so when we launched, we were just like, our goal for our first year, entire year was a thousand members, mm -hmm. right? And so we got over a thousand applications in like the oh, first wow. three months. And so to say that we were very pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest that we've had in what we've built is an understatement. And we're so grateful, um, one, for the validation of like the concept. Um, and that just helps us like stay motivated to keep things going. And so out of those thousand applications, you know, this, what we're seeing so far is that majority of them are women. And so oh, wow. that is like, that's like actually the flip of most dating services or dating apps where you have way more men and you actually have a lot of fake female profiles and women profiles. Like we are floored by the quality of the women. I mean, they are that's beautiful. Awesome. They are smart. They're accomplished. And so our job right now is really sharing that information with the men and being like, Look, if you guys want access to these, you know, amazing women, you guys need to start submitting your applications. And so we're really seeing a little bit of, um, we have to do a little bit of education for men, right? Because for guys, like 
it's more of a um, upfront effort than most dating apps. Like you just get on add a picture and like you're swiping. And so for us, you get on, you have to like answer a questionnaire, you have to go through an interview, you know, you have to um, pass a background check. And that's a lot more effort than they're used to uh, exerting, you know, in order to start meeting people. But we also tell them, how's that working out for you, right? Like how is zero effort actually working out for you when it equates to meeting high caliber and high quality women. And they're like, oh, well, it's really not. And we're like, yeah, because what else in life do you get with zero effort, zero actual investment that's of any quality or value? And so that's where we are right now. But we're excited because we're seeing a huge uptick in the amount of guys that are applying. So we're hoping that we'll be able to start matching and opening up everybody to join the app very soon. Awesome. That's amazing. And do you have plans to expand outside of DC? I'm sure you do, but what what's the roadmap for Carpe Diem? Yes, you you know all the right questions, Nick. So, um <laughs> we we are um definitely planning to be a nationwide and perhaps international service. It's funny, we've already gotten applications from Canada and and uh, and London um, and all over the US. And so we pretty much let people know right now, if you're not in the DMV area, which is where we're starting for our first year, um, one, to just make sure that we have everything down, like the onboarding process, you know, we wanna make sure that what we're building is perfect for everyone else. And so then we'll expand to other um, cities, but we're definitely looking at Atlanta, Chicago, um, New York and LA, um, and perhaps like Miami and some other cities, uh, for a subsequent launch. And so we're looking at our expansion, um, into the end of next year to look at some new cities. I love that. I've got to push hard for Chicago. Yeah. You have my, you have my, we're, my we're endorsement. Getting, you know, on our website, we have a form that pretty much says like coming to a city near you, like let oh. us know where you are so that we can really track like, you know, what cities people are in to determine like where to launch next. And Chicago's high in the list. So um, you guys are coming through. So very, very well could be the next city. You guys are battling with Atlanta though. So just know that. Oh, of all the places <laughs> that I don't want to battle, it's Atlanta. They're a very passionate yeah. crew down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, great, that's awesome to hear. My last question on Carpe Diem, then I've got a couple other ones that I wanted to ask you. Do you feel that the quality of men, since you do have to go through this extensive process, like I'm thinking back to when I was like mid twenties and all I wanted mm -hmm. to do was go on Tinder and mm -hmm. it, it was where I was in my life, right? I'm 27, mm -hmm. 25, whatever. I don't want to go through that extensive process. So do you think that going through the background check, going through the extensive application, is that bringing you higher quality individuals that you can present in front of these accomplished women? Absolutely. Right. And so yeah. and it's funny because when we talk to men, men and women say very similar things from what it is that they're looking for. Like men will say like, Hey, I, you know, I'm really tired of going out on so many on dates that don't lead to anything. You know, um, I do, really don't have the time with my busy schedule to like swipe and kind of figure out like who I should go out with and who I shouldn't go out with. I'm going on these dates and like, then it's actually, not, I'm not compatible. And I kind of feel like I'm getting used for like free meals, mm -hmm. you know? And so we're hearing all of this and, you know, on the women's side, it's like, hey, like how do I determine if he's interested in me for genuine reasons or just trying to like get me in bed? Like, mm -hmm. and so for us, it's like, there are so many benefits to Carpe Diem on both sides of, you know, the spectrums for suitors as well as for the professional black women. It's just retraining the thinking process of people who think that like dating apps should be so easy to get onto and it should be so quick for I'm meeting someone so that they realize that like, no, like we're actually saving you time, money and energy, but you have to put in that 15 minutes up front to like create your application and submit it and kind of go through our process. Um, but I think all that will be addressed like once we start the initial matching, right? Like once we start the matching, once we get that first Carpe Diem engagement, like that will start to help with the network effects of people telling their friends about how amazing Carpe Diem is and reframing the narrative around what, you know, modern dating should actually look like. I absolutely adore door the fact that you're speaking about reframing the mind, because I feel like it's so far gone. And you know, I, I gave up on dating before going on love is blind, for the mm -hmm. most part. So kudos to you for doing something about it instead of just giving up. <laughs> um, and then I have to ask uh, one last question about about the app. Do you prompt conversations? Or do you do any? 
um, nudging when you start to pair people because you you do know what they should be talking about mm -hmm. in a sense. Absolutely. So we actually, when you um, get on the app, what happens is like I send you a match, you get to see their profile, their video, everything about them. And then you both have uh, 72 hours from the initial match to host a video call in the app, right? So this is a, a part of our patented matching process where you have to host a five to 10 minute video call. So if you think back back to the days where like you go up to a woman in a bar, you chat her up for a few minutes, you see if there's any initial compatibility or chemistry. And by the end of that drink, like you're kind of exchanging numbers or you're kind of just like walking away, right? And saying mm -hmm. like, not this one. So that five to 10 minute call is kind of like that little intro date. And at the end of it, um, we ask both people if you want to remain matched. So it's only if both uh, people say right then, like, yes, I liked him, I liked her. Then we move you onto our chat platform where you can message each other. You guys can like host more video calls. You guys can really get into that getting to know you process. But for us, we don't believe that like texting is a good way to have an initial communication with anyone. You really need to actually talk to them. And so we foster that conversation with what we call icebreaker questions. So within that video call, you can click like a button <clears throat> and you're both displayed icebreaker questions that we've curated, right? So that any, anything from something that may be very like superficial, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like, you know, the questions that you kind of asked me at the beginning of this call, right? Like just to right. kind of get the juices flowing, but it could be something like may pop up that's a way deeper, right? And you guys don't have to answer them. You guys can go to the next question if you don't feel comfortable, but it's just a way to really help people who may not otherwise know what to talk about. Some people are shy, kind of get over that hump. And then yeah. the last thing I'll say about that is that the beauty of Carpe Diem is that you have a personal matchmaker, right? So say that I'm your matchmaker and I know that you're going on a date with Danielle, right? Then I may send you a quick little tidbit of fact about her ahead of your no. date. Cause I can see that you guys have scheduled the date. So I may say like, Hey, something that I know about Danielle is that family is so important to her and that, you know, so you may want to talk about like how important family is to you on your date. Right? So I can kind of fairy godmother it in the background just to help make sure that you guys have the best, um, experience possible on that first date. I think that is probably going to get stolen by other apps, but a brilliant <laughs> idea. Cause I remember times going through and I'm like, wait a minute, what was said about this? And I'm like scrolling mm -hmm. through the chats and you know, so that I think that's an awesome kind of like in the moment way to help get the, the conversation going. Another thing that you said that was pretty interesting to me, the texting piece, the mm -hmm. texting back and forth, I can tell you like, even married, it doesn't work except <laughs> doesn't work. you're like organizing logistics. Like you can't have any kind of like meaningful conversation mm -hmm. without tone, without body yeah. language, without, mm -hmm. um, it, really without context, you're having a conversation yeah. without context. So mm -hmm. I think if there's a really big takeaway that folks should, should take from this is don't text serious conversations and don't spend too much time texting, trying to get to know someone that you're deciding if you want to date or spend your life with. Mm -hmm. So I love uh, that. And you know, there's, <laughs> you know, there's so much psychology behind that. Um, and which is one of the reasons why we use video first, because if you think about it, you actually know your wife, right? Like very well, maybe the best out of anybody in the world and you guys still get your wires crossed. And so oh, when you're reading a text message from her, you actually hear her voice, right? Like, mm -hmm. because you know what she sounds like and everything, you know, the tone. So imagine you're texting someone, a complete stranger that you're, that's what everybody's doing on these apps, right? So you don't know what their voice sounds like. So what are you doing? You're constructing all of that for them right? Using your own biases before you even have the opportunity to meet them. So you're determining whether or not they're actually funny, if what they're saying is sarcastic, if what they're saying is rude, you know, you're determining all of that without actually knowing the person. And so we, it's just not beneficial. And that's why a lot of times you'll have an amazing text conversation with someone and you'll go on the date and it's super dry, right? Or you'll have a bad, a bad text conversation and maybe the person's not as responsive, but then when you meet them in person, they're amazing, right? right. And so it's just not a good way to start a relationship. So 100% agree with you. If possible, just lock yourself into pods and just divide it by a wall and <laughs> talk to each other for hours. That may be the <laughs> best, best ways to do it. You, I totally agree. That's probably the best way, which is that's why I went on the show. Like I didn't even really know anything about it uh, until after 
I started like going through the process and I was like, oh, this actually similar to what Carpe Diem is doing. It's removing a lot of the challenges that I have with dating. Mm -hmm. It's taking mm -hmm. out that endless cycle. It's taking out the, you know, you know what the funniest thing that I take? People were shocked that I would go on a date with that I read their profiles. I'm like, I actually read the profiles. I look at what you're doing in the photos and I mm -hmm. try to imagine like, are we going to get along? Yeah. Uh, do we yeah. do we do the same things with our friends? Do we you know like how is all that going to go before messaging and you know mm -hmm. a lot of people don't do that. So that's that's outstanding. Last piece on this and then I've got I've got one more for you. One, okay. how did you come up with the name Carpe DM? Because I think it's genius and I can't believe that like no one had come up with that. It's such a genius name. Thank you. You know, you know, when I started Carpe Diem and it was like really based on that video first dating process, which, you know, I said is patented now, I really was like, it has to be a name that like signifies like action, like do something mm -hmm. like don't just text somebody like do something meaningful. So then I thought about like Latin phrase like Carpe Diem sees the mm -hmm. day. Yep. But like that was actually taken on everything, carpe d d i e m, and so then I then I was just like, well, d m d m sounds just like d m d i e m, and then I was like, and then d m also is like in modern, you know, is like direct message or like it has like some modern um, uh, significance, and then for us we say carpe diem takes you from dating to marriage. So like the d m doesn't mean like direct message; it means like that journey from going from dating to marriage. And so that's really how we kind of put it together. And then uh, our tagline is seize the dating, right? So instead of seize I the day, it seize the dating. But thank you. Absolutely. It's funny, it's, yeah, I think it's... that's maybe one of the most complimented things about the company that we get is like the name. They're like, that's <laughs> insane, it's so good. It's, it's like genius and you see it and you're just, you just, you know it's a dating app. And you if you know what carpe diem means, which I think most people have an idea that means seize the day, it's just mm -hmm. genius, it's perfect. Um, Thank you. So for our, our audience, are you a single lady at the moment or have you put yourself through the Carpe Diem <laughs> process? <laughs> so I'm on the app. I'm on there. Okay. Um, I, I'm not, I don't matchmake myself. I have someone, my co-founder is my matchmaker. Very so cool. if you'd like to date me, you can join Carpe Diem and see if we get matched together. Um, I'm, I'm just like everyone else, right? Like I am looking for the love of my life and, um, some something got in the way like COVID. I don't remember if like what was that called COVID or the pandemic. But yeah, I'm actually yeah. now putting myself. Yeah, what was it called? It was so it seemed like so long ago. <laughs> but now I'm actually putting myself uh, back out there as well and trying to meet someone meaningful. So I'll see you on the app. Hopefully not you, but audience. Right. I'll see <laughs> some of y'all on the app. Hopefully. Hopefully we see an uptick of applications after this. Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> So my my last question is it's more of an open floor for you. Is there anything about you that you want to share that people wouldn't know by listening to this or viewing your social media or viewing your website? That I don't do this alone. So I feel like a lot of people see me because like I'm, you know, the founder or I'm the CEO of the company, but I have an amazing team that helps me do all of this and like that are so committed to the mission of Carpe Diem, which is to elevate black women, help create generational wealth in the community through the formation of two person, two income households. And then to say, we say to give black or to give back and we donate 5% of all of our membership fees to organizations doing amazing work in the community. And so all of us are so strongly behind the mission. My co-founder, Sally, we met at um, Howard Law School. That's where I went to law school like um, almost 15 years ago. Um, she's actually Syrian American. So if you can imagine, she like uh, really you know, believes in our mission is just doing this because of how much she believes in uh, what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're building. So I would just say that like that I have an amazing, amazing team that really um, believes in what we're doing and that we're trying our best every day to like make this thing a reality for black women everywhere. Um, and then beyond besides me, I take um, thanks and appreciation in the form of gluten free items. So like cookies <laughs> and cakes. <laughs> <laughs> gluten-free dishes so if anybody wants to like hook, hook us this up let me know <laughs> <laughs> do you uh do you like to cook or have you explored cooking with gluten-free at all so you know 
not my strong suit. So I can cook. Like there are dishes that I can cook and I can make. But my sister is actually a chef, and my mom oh. is like an amazing cook. So I'm never like the one. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I yeah, can, yeah. I can cook, but I'm never like the one that they're gonna be like, let's have Nisa make the meal. You know. So, um, uh, so I've kind of steered away from cooking. I lean into other things that I'm I'm kind of good at. So maybe I'll try some gluten free some gluten free recipes or something. If anybody has like an amazing gluten free cookbook, like let me know. Awesome. Very cool. So now thank you for being so open and talking about your dating journey and everything. Mm -hmm. I know it's, that's a, uh, that's tough sometimes, especially if it's been frustrating, like in COVID and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Now I'm going to give you a, a, do you have a couple more minutes or do you have a hard of stop? Course. Okay. I just want to give you an opportunity to ask me any questions you might have. They can be anything you want, fun, funny, serious, mm -hmm. um, and go ahead, go at it. I would love to know what was your the impetus of you starting to do this podcast and like what are you hoping to kind of get out of it over time? That's a great question. Um, so I've wanted to start a podcast for 10 years. It was originally going to be fantasy football. <laughs> I've grown up a little bit since then. I still play a little, a little bit of fantasy football, but it's not my life like it was 10 years ago. Um, and one of the things that I find very challenging in today's society and environment is that we are very divided, which I don't mm -hmm. think we could find a single person to disagree with that in pretty mm -hmm. much the whole world. But when you actually talk to people, you remove stigmas, mm -hmm. and you find out that there's a human being behind that brand that you mm -hmm. see. And that can yeah. be mental health, that can be dating and relationships, mm -hmm. that can be politics, obviously, that can be through the eyes at which we view the media or the eyes at which we view what's happening in the world. And so what I wanted to do is find individuals that were in these these key areas where I think there's a lot of stigmas. And I think there's a lot of passion and talk about individuals on a personal level to get to know them to uncover what makes them tick to uncover why someone would start a dating app uh, in a flooded market, you know, why would why would someone want to put themselves in that position and then remove you're removing stigmas from mm -hmm. dating and you're replacing them with you know actual quality ways to engage with one another and things mm -hmm. to engage about and so i find like people as individuals very interesting mm -hmm. and i like to ask questions to kind of get to the bottom of it and uncover or peel back the onion as to what makes them a human being and then mm -hmm. hopefully share that with everyone so anyone who may you know, see you, uh, you know, speaking somewhere or may see you or find you through your website or may know you in some way from being involved in the community, like why? What about that makes you who you are? So that they can start to see human beings with one another and we can start yeah. to hopefully remove stigmas around some of these things. That's awesome. My my whole thing, and I, I talk about this, I think last week with a guest, but ever since I was a kid and we grew up relatively like lower working class. So there were times when we would have to go through the couch to find change to go buy dinner mm -hmm. or else there wasn't going to be dinner. So mm -hmm. we were we moved a lot too. And I always remember thinking about like, oh, we could almost be homeless. Mm -hmm. There's times when it was like, are we going to be homeless? And my parents did a, mm -hmm. an amazing job of keeping us safe. And it's like in retrospect mm -hmm. that I see how how much they struggled at times. And so mm -hmm. when I think about that and I'm like, well, I walk and I see homeless people. There's a lot in Chicago, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I talk to them mm -hmm. and find out that like, hey, guess what? Nobody grew up and said, I want to be homeless when I'm an adult. Right. And that there's right. a lot of there's a lot of mental illness. Yes. Are there people mm -hmm. that are choosing? I don't think so, but maybe fine. I'm open to the mm -hmm. idea. But what? happens is they're still human beings, they still have a story to tell. And they have a there's a reason one way or another, that they're living under a bridge or living in a right. tent. And we shouldn't act like they're invisible. Right. So that's kind of where my thought process started uh, mm -hmm. with the format of the podcast mm -hmm. and um, just uncovering like what makes people a human, like, let's make mm -hmm. let's humanize people again, yeah. stop stigmatizing people. I love that. Yeah, thanks. That was Amazing. a long answer. To say no, that was great. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any other any other good questions you want to ask? 
so okay so you're married happily um and we all know the journey and we all love the journey thank you so much for putting yourself out there like that by the way like oh my gosh yeah i feel like it's amazing it really really is um but so we're, we've been talking about carpe diem we've told you all about carpe diem if you were single is carpe diem something that you would use and why i would why absolutely not? i would absolutely use it um the only reason i would say i would not is if I didn't know the stuff that you shared today about mm -hmm. like the effort that goes into it and the the personal touch because I feel and I feel like just my marketing you're a marketer I believe or have experience mm -hmm. with it too from your website like you'll have to you'll have to educate more than you ideally want to because it yeah. is such a complicated experience that you're delivering I mean it really is compared to as you said uploading a picture and you're swiping in 30 seconds there's a lot that goes into this so I feel like for me I would if I knew then a hundred percent but if I just saw it as another dating app then that would probably be the only thing that would hold me off of it that's so smart and so true yeah we yeah. we have education to do absolutely yeah but I think you're gonna get some good success stories soon it sounds like and I, I think it, the best story is going to be when you find your person and then you're like, I, I created this. I found my person. I'm living yeah. proof it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I do have another question. Yeah. So when you're thinking back to being single to now being married, do you feel like there were any, what were like the clear, I guess, to you, like benefits of becoming married and like committing to one person? So I've always been a, with the exception of maybe like a year, I've always mm -hmm. been someone who's like seeking a relationship, seeking mm -hmm. someone to spend my time with. I think the coolest thing for me or where I benefit the most is I'm introverted, so I need time to myself, but I mm -hmm. like the fact that you have a partner to do things with and that it's kind of like built in because my love mm -hmm. language or how I receive love, one of the main ways is through quality time. Mm -hmm. So having that with, Danielle is, it's amazing. Like even when it's, mm -hmm. it's a date, like we have a date night every week and we have a night where we watch TV, a TV show together every week. And like, just having that kind of stuff is, it's really fun to, and keeps you bonded. Like at the end of the day, yeah. it's who, who can you sit on the couch with and it's okay. And you don't yeah. need the stuff. The stuff yeah. is fun though. <laughs> Well, I, I love that. That's so true. I mean, that's a really good thing. Like at the end of the day, who do you want to just like snuggle up with on the couch? Because mm -hmm. that's it, right? Yeah. I can't tell you how many times my therapist has told me that over the last six years, where she's mm -hmm. like, at the before meeting Danielle, at the end of the day, you you don't need this, you don't need that, mm -hmm. you don't need you don't need to worry about people responding to your texts or calling you, mm -hmm. or you just need someone that is going to be there at the end of the day, and you're happy it's them. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Good therapist. She does good, <laughs> I think. It's like, what's next? So, like, what should we be expecting from you in, like, the next year? Oh, that's a good question, too. <laughs> Launching this podcast is mm -hmm. uh, a big deal for me. Uh, we also have Love is Blind After the Altar uh, mm -hmm. has been announced. There's no date yet. So we do have that coming up, too, where you'll get to catch up with not just Danielle and I, but you'll also be able to catch up with all the other cast members mm -hmm. and see what what we're up to these days. Mm -hmm. um, and then additionally from there, I'd really, really, really like to have more of these conversations with people, expand the podcast. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of other ideas to kind of grow it into, I don't want to say like a podcast network, but I have mm -hmm. some ideas of sort of taking it to another level where there's different types of content mm -hmm. as well. So we'll, We'll get the launch off first, but then hoping to expand that in a little bit and maybe turn this into something that I can spend more time on. Change some lives. Okay, I only have one more question. Yeah. So who from the show, other couples or people, do you guys still talk to or hang out with? Like who who are who are the actual cool kids like on the show? That's a good question. Um, I will say the cast is very for the most part close. Mm -hmm. um, you almost like I jokingly say it was trauma bonding. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that I might be breaking NDA by speaking in that way. But you know, and Danielle keeps in touch with a lot of the, the women. Um, mm -hmm. I keep in touch. I keep in touch less, but that's like by nature who I am. I, yeah. I kind of have my six friends and they're, they're everything. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I talked to Shane, I talked to Kyle. Um, I talked to like my 
best friend from the show didn't even make the I mean he was in it for he was in the pods for a couple of days and didn't didn't mm-hmm. really make it. Uh, I talked mm-hmm. to him a couple times a week. Uh so mm-hmm. he's probably my my best friend out of it, but yeah, we do keep in touch and spend time hanging out and you know, break we broke the Wall Street Art Fair when we hung out a couple of weeks ago in Old Town mm-hmm. with Deep D and mm-hmm. Danielle and I with Deep D was like you would I don't know. It's so crazy sometimes to think people like really are shut are like obsessed with with and healthy like TV personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's hard. I think it's just how vulnerable you guys are and I'm assuming that like they put a fraction of like the actual moments. I mean, as someone who's produced a dating show before, I'm like, I know that they put a fraction of like what really happened um on the actual show, yeah. but it's it's still like amazing, you know, to see people yeah. be really vulnerable and you know you just really we get invested in you guys like in your success and like wanting to see you guys do well and like stay in love because it's kind of like it gives everybody hope right like Mm -hmm. that you know it's out there and so it's one of the things i feel like we do a lot of like you know letting people know like despite the challenges that you're seeing like it's all worth it right like it's all worth it when you get home and like you cuddle up in the sofa and you're with that person but you still have to kind of go through it and like you guys show not just the process but like also like the positive outcome so yeah yeah. exactly and you're absolutely right i mean i i forget how much there was but there's like hundreds of thousands of hours of video that gets Mm -hmm. cut down i think they told us like our entire story was an hour and 13 minutes or something Mm -hmm. around that and when you think about the fact that we would spend six hours a day towards the end talking to just each other in the pods or to Mm -hmm. think that we would be you know having five hours of a dinner conversation and you get to see 30 seconds of it or in some cases none of it some of it just Mm -hmm. gets completely and that Mm -hmm. there's these relationship building moments and there's these connections that are being fostered and they're being made and then you get to see some of it and you get to see maybe enough of it but there's so Mm -hmm. much more that goes into it otherwise Mm -hmm. like if you think about watching an hour and 13 minutes of someone's love story and then thinking they should get married. Yeah. <laughs> weird. But it's so funny weird. because I feel like, I feel like they got a lot of content. Like we might need some like repurposing going. Like, <laughs> I mean, like we didn't know until the reunion that like deep D and what's his name was Kyle. 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 Like yep. we're like also really feeling each other and like very yeah. close. And he was close to, proposing to her I'm like that was like mind-blowing and we didn't know and then all that tension that should have been like on the vacation and like when you guys were at the place like they didn't show any of that between him and her I'm like so look I just feel like the producers go back and look at the footage see if we could do some like capsules of just like right individual couples because I feel like people would really just drop it on Netflix people would watch it or not watch it but like I feel like there's couples that I'm super invested in that I would definitely watch way more of the interactions um, between them than they actually showed. So maybe, maybe one day we'll get something. Yeah, and I can tell you like Kyle and I were close. We, we during filming, we were close and he was really into Deep D. And mm-hmm. there was moments where he was just like deciding, should I back down, should I not? And none of it's there. Mm-hmm. But that's, I guess the, the nature, right? You're at the mm-hmm. producers and editors yeah i mean they're still making tv at the end of the day they're still making entertainment but i just feel like the content is there like don't let it go to waste like get get some junior editor in there (laughs) start right yeah Yeah. do like uh i don't even know but i think you're right like there's there's plenty of footage to do there do an extended cut Mm -hmm. i would love to see extended cuts but i mean i feel like each episode could just follow one of you guys right like just like you and your conversations with different people, just Deep D and like her conversations with, or like the top two people that, you know, or the person that we didn't see you connect with or whatever. Like, I just, I don't know. I just feel like there's more, there's more mining there that they need to do. So we'll see maybe, but I'm looking for the, for the new show also. Yeah, absolutely. I I think you're, I, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point they do something with it because Mm -hmm. there's so much footage and they pique so much curiosity. That's the the weird thing. Again, I'm probably breaking NDA by saying this, but the weird thing about watching it it back. Yeah, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. The weird thing about watching it back was that I, I mean, I remember everything pretty clearly how it happened, but like some of the things that were going on with the couples, like was out of order or Mm -hmm. didn't really like tell the story of that I experienced with them, Mm -hmm. you know, and and it's weird because they can just literally 
obviously do whatever they want for TV and edit things yeah. in whatever ways they want. But like, I felt like there were so many, even Danielle and I, like there were so many tender moments between us that just mm -hmm. never made it anywhere yeah. near obviously this cut. And mm -hmm. from my perspective, it's like, if you have a couple that's gotten married, right? That proves mm -hmm. the concept works. You wouldn't you want to show, obviously we had conflict. Every couple has conflict. Wouldn't you mm -hmm. want to show some of those moments? Like we had a lot of moments in the pods and mm -hmm. there was one montage, like right before the end of the first episode where they showed like a couple clips, but that's, and maybe because we were boring in the pods because mm -hmm. we connected right away, but like there's so mm -hmm. much there that could have, I feel like helped tell the story of how we were so connected mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. even through conflict, like we wanted to continue to work on it and mm -hmm. continue to work towards each other because there was such a deep connection mm -hmm. and a little behind yeah. the scenes it's, for it's me. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. And I, I was like ha 10 or 11 people out of 15 through the first day. And I was like, this is awful. Like I, and no offense, everyone, everyone on the show is great for the most part, mm -hmm. but like, I'm like, I'm not connecting with anyone here. And mm -hmm. I was feeling like the matchmaking that was going on wasn't, mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah, okay, just because I like to give back to my community, that doesn't mean that I match with someone who works in a not for profit, maybe, right, right. But you know, it's like, it was so mm -hmm. rudimentary. And then Danielle, and it was just like an instant connection. So you're like, they did something right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's tough. Exactly. It's all, especially for TV. Cause like they gotta, y'all gotta look good. Y'all gotta be attractive. Y'all, you know, there has to be juicy moments and friction moments and, yeah. you know, loving moments and the right balance. So overall, I think you guys are really well portrayed, but yeah, well, just thank you. tell the producers that there's more, there's more stuff that we, the viewers would like to see. So we need they to are <laughs> Yeah, we need, we need a petition. We're gonna start. A, we're gonna start a petition. But yeah, I know that you're in the area. So if you ever wanna, like, I'm in Old Town all the time, like, or in um, whatever. So if you guys ever wanna get together for drinks or whatever, let me know. I'd love cool. to do that. Bring bring along Sally. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. Where can people find you? Yeah, so people can find us online. If you want to join Carpe Diem, it's at Carpe, the letter D, the letter M, dating.com. And then um, we are Carpe Diem Dating on all social platforms. So Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok. <laughs> We're getting into that TikTok generation now. <laughs> and then if you want to follow me, I am Carpe DM Boss on, on IG. So love to interact with you guys. If you have any questions about the service or anything else, you feel free to reach out to me directly. That's great. Thank you, Nasa, for joining us this week on Conversations with Nick Thompson. All those links she mentioned will be right below. And be sure that if you enjoyed this conversation, you leave a review, follow us, and download your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or everywhere. Links will be below. Thank you, and until next time. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Conversations with Nick Thompson you enjoyed the show, be sure to follow us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Links can be found in the description below, and we can't wait to see you next time.